Disclaimer. The following content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained in this presentation constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by BTC Media, the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network, or any third-party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments. Well, hey there. Welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. So, uh, Dave, back in June, uh, our company put on the uh, Bitcoin 2019 conference, and uh, I thought it was a smashing success. It was awesome. It really was. Uh, I think the coolest thing was just getting to see all the really great people there and um, just sort of see the community come together like that. People were incredible. Speakers were incredible. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Uh, there really were some great speakers. Uh, the crowd was awesome. Um, but we've had some really awesome sponsors too. And uh, I, I really can't stress this enough. They were hugely instrumental in making the conference possible. Indeed. Those are the kind of companies that are really helping push the decentralized movement to giving more people power over their financial situation. Yeah, really. Um, and we had the opportunity to, to snag a few of them and... Uh, do quick interviews at the conference, and uh, we're going to be featuring a couple of those today on the show. Right. We'll be hearing from Sean Rock, CMO of Crypto.com, and Jenny Shaver, COO at Salt Lending. Yeah, these were just short little fun interviews. Uh, we just talked a little bit about their companies, you know, how they got into crypto, and we had a little bit of fun with end-of-the-year Bitcoin price predictions. Right. But I will say some of those were pretty high. Uh, I would agree with you, Dave. Uh, but at the time, Bitcoin was sort of on the uptick, and there was a buzz in the air. It had nothing to do with the conference. <laughs> yeah, even during that buzz, though, I uh, made a prediction, and I'm still pretty confident in it, Graham. What was that again, Dave? 25K in a year. Yeah, uh, I mean, I hope, I hope you're right. Um, I think I'm going to change mine. I initially said 18.5. Uh, I think I'm going to go with... Thirteen five, pessimistic. I, I I don't agree with that word. It's still you know it's it's three and a half k more uh, where it's at now. So I mean, it's an improvement. Well, buddy, if we were saying that we knew what was going on, we would be lying. So anything can happen. Anything could happen. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see, Dave. There's really nothing else we can do. Well, that is true. But that's kind of just with anything in life, really. Well. Before we get into the news and our interviews, we'd like to take a quick moment to talk about the Coin Mine One. Mm, Yes, the Coin Mine One. In our last ad, I said that I was mining Bitcoin. That's not exactly true. Uh, It's come to my attention that the Coin Mine One does not actually mine Bitcoin. Oh? Ugh. Yes, but it does convert the altcoins that it does mine, that's Monero, Dash, Zcash, and Ethereum, into Bitcoin automatically. So... It's still plug in and play, and I chose Bitcoin, and I'm still getting Bitcoin. Okay, so I I get it. Um, Technically, it's not the same thing. You're not actually mining Bitcoin, but the end result is the user still can get Bitcoin if they want it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I love the design of it. It's super stylish and cool, um, and it's really quiet, unlike other GPU miners. Yeah, seriously, we plugged that thing in, like, a week ago, and it's like three feet away. I, I've not heard it at all. I didn't even know it was plugged in, actually. I uh, I forgot it was down there. I, I, I didn't even hear it. Um, and you know what, Dave? It pulls less power than a PlayStation, so we're not sitting here worrying about our electricity bill, even though we don't pay it. Also a great way to stack sacks. <sighs> stack those sats, indeed. Shout out to Marty Bent and Matt Odell for coming up with that. Awesome little phrase that we're all getting behind. Um, I'm pretty sure they came up with it. For real. Yeah. But um, CoinMine One, it's also a Bitcoin Lightning node, and you can send and receive Bitcoin to anyone, anywhere in the world, for free. That's pretty cool. It's super cool. And, you know, on top of that, it's just, it's a perfect device if you've ever had a remote interest in mining, but you didn't want to go through all the technical hassle like myself. Yeah, I'm not... Exactly, technically gifted. Yeah, me either. But um, 
That's why I like the CoinMine One. Plugged it in, set up the app on my phone, and I said I want Bitcoin, so it's pretty cool. If you're interested in checking these out, maybe getting one for yourself, visit coinmine.com slash bitmag, and you'll get $50 off. Again, that's coinmine.com slash B-I-T-M-A-G for $50 off. Don't worry, we'll post a link in the show notes in case you forget or you want to come back to it some other time. And we'll also be doing a CoinMine giveaway this Thursday, the 29th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure to follow Bitcoin Magazine at Bitcoin Magazine on Twitter. Keep an eye out for that post, which will include giveaway details. Yeah, you don't want to miss that. It, it'll be pretty general, like like, retweet, follow CoinMine, something simple, but um, just keep an eye out for that. And uh, if you want to take a closer look at the CoinMine, uh, check out the, another link in the show notes uh, to the CoinMine unboxing video. That's pretty cool. Now, time for the news. In a bid to make Bitcoin programming a little bit easier, three engineers from Blockstream have developed Miniscript, a simpler version of Script, which is the current programming language used in Bitcoin transactions. Miniscript is meant to serve as a curated collection of tools from the full script toolkit, making it easier to use and verify for human programmers. Though Miniscript is still a work in progress, earlier versions have been released and used. And speaking of smart people writing things for Bitcoin, an academic paper was recently released with some bullish implications. The paper, called How Do Private Currencies Affect Government Policy, was written by professors from New York University and McGill University. It concluded that non-fiat currencies like Bitcoin can generate welfare for citizens and play a significant role in economies with high volatility. In short, it was another testament to Bitcoin as a global hedge against state-controlled economies, citing Venezuela as an example. Of course, despite Bitcoin's success as free money in Venezuela, regulators in the U.S. are grappling with how to potentially oversee it. To that end, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo voiced his opinion that cryptocurrency transactions should be regulated as standard electronic transactions. We should use the same framework that we use to regulate all financial transactions today, Pompeo told CNBC. That's essentially what these are. Pompeo did acknowledge the inherent difficulty in applying traditional regulations to new technology like Bitcoin, but he stood firm on his idea. Meanwhile, halfway across the world, major flooding has been disrupting the global center for Bitcoin mining. China's Sichuan province has experienced waves of flooding, leading to substantial damage at significant Bitcoin mining facilities. Cryptocurrency mining pool Poolin, for instance, posted footage of the damage on Twitter. Some estimates hold that more than 70% of Bitcoin mining takes place in China. And Sichuan is a particularly attractive area as it offers an abundance of hydroelectric power. As some of the world's largest mining operations recover from the damage, the Bitcoin network's hash rate should too. Throughout the end of August, Bavarian entrepreneur Vitas Zeller and a group of Bitcoiners known as Team Satoshi will be running the Satoshi Friathlon. The triathletes will swim, run, and bike from Zug, Switzerland to Munich, Germany, all to raise awareness for Bitcoin. Throughout the journey, they will be passing a lightning network torch to each other. Zeller told Bitcoin Magazine, I believe Bitcoin needs more voices from within the ecosystem that show openly that they stand for this. And sports is a great way of doing that. Our first interview is with Sean Rock, CMO of Crypto.com. Crypto.com is one of those brave companies trying to accelerate cryptocurrency adoption by offering a full range of financial services blended with crypto. Could you tell me a little bit about Crypto.com? You bet, you bet, yeah. So uh, we're a company that uh, started in 2016. Uh, crypto, uh, with a name like that, you would expect we do something in crypto, but uh, crypto, crypto trading and payments uh, company. We've got a uh, Visa credit card that allows you to spend your crypto uh, wherever Visa is accepted. With that comes a Visa, uh, sorry, a um, crypto wallet with a range of not only the coins and tokens, but then a range of other services such as our crypto earn, crypto invest, and crypto credit. So uh, really the full range of financial services, um, all in infused with crypto. Yeah, um, and you told me that you're based in Hong Kong. Yep. And you live in Hong Kong yep. too. 
Yeah. Well, so yeah, and I also want to know uh, how your jet lag is. <laughs> you actually seem like you're you're doing, I'm doing all right. Good. Yeah. Well, uh, we've had a busy last couple of days. Uh, just before the the conference kicked off, we announced our U.S. card launch, something we've been working on for quite a while, and so that's been announced to be next month, July fourteenth, uh, seven fourteen, as some people would know. But uh, really looking forward to that. Something we've been working on for quite a while, uh, getting through all the various. Uh, hoops and yo-yos that we have to do, but we're, we're really we're looking forward to bringing it to, to the United States. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, I, I think the the proposition, what we've been doing is we've, uh, t- as you, you said, we're based in Hong Kong. We used uh, Singapore as really a test market, mm-hmm. uh, got all the operational kinks out of the system, and now we're ready to bring it to the United States. Uh, with that has come a range of you know, regulatory and filings and all of those things that we need to do to be able to bring our services to customers here. And uh, basically, 714 uh, is the time to kick it off. And it basically becomes available to everyone. Right now, it's a reservation standpoint. You uh, use our MCO token to, uh, depending on the tier that you reserve, reserve a card. Uh, You also use the token for a range of utility, uh, getting... uh, benefits on on the platform whether it's uh, fees being waived or discounts and stuff like that and uh this is a specific question if you, sure. and if you can't answer it, it's perfectly fine <laughs> i'm just curious uh what were more of the difficult uh regulatory hurdles you had to overcome to look into launching a product in the u.s I think for us, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a difficulty. For us, we, it's not new. Mm-hmm. Um, all the things that um, aren't necessarily what a Bitcoin maximalist would want, mm-hmm. um, things like KYC, um, and then how we actually are managing our data to not only from a customer data and privacy perspective, but on the other side, we've also got uh, all the information security and then crypto security, um, making sure that all of those mm-hmm. things are fitting together properly. Uh, probably, I wouldn't call mm-hmm. them challenges or uh, things that we didn't know, but things that we've been working on ver- very hard. Yeah. Um, and yes, so I was just curious uh, between the U.S. and Hong Kong, the difference in regulations. Um I think uh, maybe not necessarily Hong Kong. I think w- why we had uh, started off for taking customers initially in Singapore mm-hmm. is that the regulatory framework there wasn't particularly um, friendly or unfriendly. It was just clear. They mm-hmm. were very clear mm-hmm. about what they would want to do. If you go back in time uh, in 2017, the U.S., um, because it's regulated primarily by states, mm-hmm. it's been a little bit more difficult because you have to meet certain requirements per state. And so that process has just taken um, yeah, longer than we would have hoped, but it's something to do right and do well, and then we're ready to, to take it forward. Yeah, that's interesting. You're making a good point where um, it's not necessarily uh, hard, tough regulations or easy regulations. A lot of times it can just be a lack of clarity or clarity. Yeah, exactly. I, I think for any business, not just crypto related, um, but any business just needs to know what the, the, the lay of the land is. Mm-hmm. And then if you are in business and want to be in business, then you, you play by those rules. And for us, that, that's never been a negotiable or something that we've ever tried to go in the gray area. Just sure. play it straight down the line. So um, crypto.com, I, I'm looking at your website right now. Yeah. Um, and I see a few different um, parts of your, uh, of your business and the, the new ones are credit and earn. Yes. Can you explain credit and then earn? Yeah, definitely. Um, so maybe I'll use earn as it, probably the easiest one that people can understand is uh, the opportunity to deposit a range of cryptos, uh, BTC, LTC, XRP, ETH, MCO. Do I get full credit? I uh, think, think those are all of them. But uh, if you deposit those, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you uh, interest in, in those uh, currencies back, um, whether at a three-month, a one-month, or a flexible term. So from that perspective, anyone who's a holder of, uh, and holder being H-O-D-L, uh, of, a, of a currency can hold on to them and actually get a guaranteed 8% if they're at, uh, at, at the maximum. Which is, again, with our token, if you hold some of the MCO token and stake it, you get that benefit. On the other side, uh, it is not exactly how banks work, but it's a similar type of thing. If you take deposits in, then you lend deposits out. Mm -hmm. And in the case of our credit product, it's a collateralized loan. 
So you deposit your uh, crypto in, and then you have the ability to go spend it. So we give you kind of a credit line based on, uh, in this case, BTC is about 40% LTV, so that you can then um, t take it out in a stable coin and you're able to spend it. And so that, that's kind of the balance that we're looking at is that people want those services. If you believe in your crypto and you, 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 you say, hey, I think um, I, I, I hold some Bitcoin, I, I need to spend it. But I don't want to lose those coins because I think they're going to appreciate in value. Here's a credit line that allows you to go ahead and, and spend it and then pay it back. And once you pay it back, you get you get all your crypto back as well. OK. And uh, Sean, how, how big is Crypto.com as, as far as a company goes? Yeah, we've uh, we've grown pretty rapidly. Uh, we're now about 130 people and we've mm -hmm. got offices, uh, small offices in uh, Singapore and the United States and our biggest offices in Hong Kong. We also have a back office in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, OK. Um, and, and, and so a lot with a lot of people we've talked to today, we've sort of uh, asked asked them about um, their experiences in the bear market. Sure. Um, primarily, we're thinking about Bitcoin, but um, I'm not sure how much it applies to your business. Definitely. But um, we're always curious to hear uh, what's something interesting that you as an individual or your company sure. has learned yeah. through going through the bear market. Yeah, I think for us, uh, just as I kind of made the joke with the, the word hold, the other one is the word build. Uh, and when every time there's a bear market, it's a time to build. And our team, probably if we go back to the beginning of the bear market, we probably were around 50 people. Mm -hmm. And so we've grown to 130, uh, a range of new products launched. All of those been built during the, the, the bear market. And the intention is that while um, you know people are on the sidelines, we, we need to make our products even better. Mm -hmm. And then be able to bring them out. And then if the bear market happens to, to, to die out and move into bull, uh, which, of course, we're hoping is the case, th then we're ready for that. And we can, ca we can get the benefit of uh, coming, coming out of the, the, bull mar the bear market into the bull market. Yeah, uh, that, that's interesting. I like that you sort of you're not you're not jumping on the fact that we're in a bull market now. I think many people, we, we hope, including but, myself, yeah. have, have sort of like caught ourselves in saying, you know, now that we're out of the bear market, which I don't, <laughs> don't, I don't know it. if that's <laughs> true. Yeah, touch wood. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's very interesting. Um, uh, as far as the next year goes, yeah. um, I know you have this launch of your product in July. Yep. But I, I'm just curious. Uh, uh, what are you excited for, looking forward to, um, thinking about uh, opportunities-wise for Crypto.com? Yeah, I think for us, if you, if you put it in one word, it's the word adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you try to think through, okay, if you've built, you know, a, a, a ability to buy and sell a range of tokens, you then have a range of uh, services that you can then provide off of that. Those are all kind of setting up. But then we have the other side, which the Visa card is part of it. The MCO Visa card provides one method of payment. But we spend a lot of time uh, during the, the bear market actually starting up our own blockchain to provide cryptocurrency transaction settlement. So the ability to directly uh, uh, transact in crypto. So several different variants of those. Um, one is kind of like a crypto.com pay button on a uh, website. That would spawn a QR code, one of those uh, two-dimensional barcodes that you scan with the phone. It spawns your uh, uh, crypto wallet. You select the payment, and you can pay directly. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've demoed that. You can go to shop.crypto.com to try it out for yourself. Um, that And then the other one is probably even more difficult, which is actually how do we do crypto transactions at retail point of sale without changing the point of sale? And so we've been working on some things. We, we just recently demoed that, which shows the ability now, not, not a 2D barcode, but a regular barcode, that a point of sale in, in many retailers, they can scan that barcode. Again, it goes through the same process of um, pulling into your app. You, you select the crypto and you make the payment. The, the merchant didn't change anything. The merchant still gets paid in fiat, but you are paying out in crypto. And so the ability to do that will really start to bring that barrier that we've had of crypto transactions to, to a close. It's not requiring someone to have a Bitcoin point of sale or an Ethereum point of sale. Having a wallet that then can provide those um, uh, QR codes or the barcodes seems to be the way forward. And that's what we're working on right now. So, you know, over the next six, maybe 12 months, 
we really hope to see that help to drive the adoption. That's very interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and then this thing externally about like the cryptocurrency industry in general, yeah. what do you see as uh, a major hurdle for the next year? Or obstacle, however you want to look at it. Well, that's a, I mean, maybe the same same answer. Gosh, I don't. I'm not trying to get out of it, but yeah. it is a, the adoption story. Is yeah. that um, while while you've seen a number of projects come online, you've seen you know massive amounts of uh, uh, money being put into you know invested into projects. We should start to actually see that come to fruition, where you're going to have the the harvest of, you know, hey, someone put some money in in an ICO or an IEO or whatever the case is, and now we're going to start to see that come to life. I think that's great. Um, what will those problems that will be solved with those solutions? You know, there's a whole whole range of those going on. The question I think still comes back to how do we go beyond being either speculative or just being a method of payment, which is simply uh, transfer money be, me to you. If it now becomes something that can be used at retail, then I think it opens up the whole financial services sector. And that that's really what I think a whole bunch of us uh, ourselves and we wouldn't really call them competitors, but people in the same space are raising up loud and clear that there's an opportunity here that customers are not being served. You and I going to a bank. It's not a hundred year problem. It's not a 200 year problem. It's a thousand year problem. The whole way that money has been managed in the past has not been to the benefit of the customer. And we'd like to change that. Sean, where do you think Bitcoin's going to be at at the end of the year? Oh, you knew you, you checked the price To infinity before. and beyond. <laughs> yeah, so. You checked the price before we started. Before yeah, we... So it, yeah, so I said, I said 25000 all right. So for, for full disclosure, the, the number currently as we tape this was uh, 11,700. So clearly the answer has to be at least double that. No, <laughs> uh, let, let's say double that. Let's say 22K just to make it nice and easy. Okay. But okay. Uh, I, I think the, the opportunity there really starts to come into looking at some of the technical fundamentals mm -hmm. in, in the case of Bitcoin as a, as a, as a coin itself. Um, but also that adoption. If the demand increases, the supply is fixed, well, we'll see how it goes. But uh, I, I, I give you a corollary to that. Uh, at, at Christmas dinner, I was being asked, because I'm the guy who's in crypto. Oh, yeah. I was being asked by a whole bunch of stock people. For all that know, person in, in a different... <laughs> exactly. I think you probably everybody who's listening to this probably has heard that one, right? So what's the S&P 500 going to be? And this is right when the S&P was taking a header. <laughs> And it was like, oh, it's going to be down 20%. And I was the only guy who said up 5%. And now I'm looking like the real genius here. So at that point, Bitcoin was down, I don't know, we were down pretty bad, about 60% or 50% or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously the shoot up from 3,000 range uh, to 11,700 uh, has been great. The question is, if, if what, will, what will be the factors that drive that? And as I said, adoption is going to be key. Um, are there other factors that play a part? Um, what will be some of the barriers getting out of the way? But I think if you were to say 20,000, 22, I think it's all within realm. I mean, that, that, that goes above the last high. It puts us in a space where people, um, you know, again, if people are starting to talk about it, it, it it's, it's plausible. So might as well say something good like that. Yeah, I won't say a hundred thousand and go to a Caribbean uh, boat and yeah. you know cause trouble, but it's all good. Wait, who are you talking about? I don't know. <laughs> like if it, if it was like seventy five or a hundred thousand, I think we would have problems. I think they're <laughs> like I think genuinely like everyone at this conference would would be flooded in one way or another. It would be crazy. And yeah, so um, here's to being optimistic but realistic. Well, yeah, I I, th I think the other thing is is. Um, I think if you actually want to see the ecosystem grow, the overblown speculation is probably not the best thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's a rational reason that we can begin to ratchet towards that, I think that's fair. Um, I think where, I guess for us, we have felt a bit of a challenge is that the market, and especially let's say the mass media, they did a great job to make sure that everyone knew what Bitcoin was. 
but not what Bitcoin was or what it was about. So then mm-hmm. it's all been about the train wrecks or the the ambulance chasing. Yeah. You know, this got hacked or this didn't work or whatever the case is versus, you know, real use cases. Mm-hmm. And I think as those come to fore, um, hopefully the tone will change dramatically uh, and that will give people something else to think about besides just the speculative bubble. Our second interview is with Jenny Shaver, COO of Salt Lending. Salt has gotten a lot of attention lately for being a part of the burgeoning industry of crypto-backed lending. Hey, Jenny. So <laughs> earlier earlier we were talking about uh, getting into crypto. And from what I understand, you came from American Express. Yeah. Could you just tell me more about that story? Yeah, it's about as stodgy and traditional finance as it gets. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I, I've been in, I, I started off as a coder. I was a full stack web developer, um, really got in, more interested in sort of the strategy behind those kinds of projects and um, wound my way through advertising and then into uh, financial services at American Express, uh, doing, you know, process engineering around uh, digital transformation, agile at scale, um, and then digital product management for, for financial services products, which is really a fun tension of how you create um, an easy, intuitive user experience with something Thing that's very complicated and regulatory heavy and compliance driven. Um, and then really like uh, American Express and a lot of traditional finance started whispering about blockchain, right? And it mm-hmm. became this sort of like FOMO, of like, uh, okay, we, we know what blockchain is, we think, right? Um, but we think we need it, right? Because everybody's talking about it. We don't want to get left behind. Um, so we're going to do this hackathon. We would do like internal hackathons, which is very cool. Um, but they're like, okay, we're going to do the hackathon, but do make sure blockchain's incorporated in some way. And so we're like, what? <laughs> um, but that's when I first started hearing about it. And I knew that this was something that was going to just be a wave, right? That was going to hit big. Um, and then when I uh, moved from New York to Denver, I was looking for an opportunity here. And just by luck, by like fate and circumstance, found salt. Um, and then, you know, didn't really know anything about crypto. Was really more interested in sort of blockchain application for financial services. Um, and then just got hooked, right? The project was very cool. Uh, the caliber of people there were just like, it blew me away, impressive. Um, and yeah, I've been, I've been there over a year. I'm just like, you know, completely obsessed now with the project. Um, and now you're actually starting to see more mass adoption of blockchain um, in different sort of uh, ways in traditional finance. Um, and then projects like Salt and others are like going strong. Yeah. And, and can you sort of break down uh, what Salt does? Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, lending is their, is the big product, yeah. just all parts of the business. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, uh, summary is like we're a crypto back lender, right? We were one of the first ones, or maybe the first one in the space. Uh, we've been live on our platform since uh, December 2017 um, and then sort of revamped the platform last August, which was right in the middle of sort of the uh, the crash and sort of the, the, the bear market, which actually was, I think, a blessing in a way. Um, you know, we weathered that um, and uh, we were able to sort of really focus on the infrastructure of our platform. We built like an incredibly performant platform for monitor, uh, monitoring people's loans, building out a bespoke custody solution that is like as performance as any of the big custody competitors out there um, and really offer a product now a full service experience where, you know, somebody that wants to take a long position on their crypto, whether it's just an individual that is like gotten in early or has a significant amount of crypto um, or it's a business like a miner who, you know, has a lot of their revenue in crypto and wants to hold it or an ICO that has like a significant amount of Bitcoin and wants to hold it on their balance sheet. And we can provide liquidity solutions through term loans. Um, you know, we pay out in fiat and stable coin. We we're, and again, working to like, you know, increase the amount of chains we support um, and then uh, more convenient funding options like stable coins and things like that. And can you sort of explain some of the uh, interest rate versus return rates uh, that you offer? Yeah. So, yeah, because we offer, you know, we're working on both sides. So uh, for capital providers, it's great because it's sort of this sort of indirect exposure to crypto. So we, you know, manage all the risk. You don't have to actually invest directly in crypto if you're not quite ready for that. So if like you're a hedge fund and are just looking for just some kind of indirect investment in a crypto, you know, our returns for our uh, investors are you know going to be somewhere in like the six to eight percent range. Um, we're operating on a really slim margin to be competitive for uh, consumers. So on the lendings and the borrowing side, you're, we're going to offer anything between, you know, five, nine to 12, nine, right. Percent, depending on sort of the riskiness of the loan of your loan to value position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Um, and you're talking about the bear market earlier. Uh, could you just yeah. explain uh, what do you think uh, you you could sit, go with the route of you as a individually mm-hmm. or salt, the salt team in general? What do you think uh, you've learned from going through the bear market? Oh, <laughs> Um, or how about this? Let me rephrase it a different way. What's the most interesting thing you've learned through the bear market? Yeah. I mean, to me, it's, uh, that things are cyclical. Um, you know, we're seeing the bounce back, um, with every bounce back too. And I think over the time of, of Bitcoin actually, you know, being a substantial asset class, um, going back five years with sort of the ebbs and the flows, um, you see, you know, more and more sophisticated investors enter the market and the, the more volume, the more scale we have, uh, the, the less volatile things will become. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're still seeing, you know, with the uh, market cap so small, you're seeing one major trade move the market. Right. And then with all of the now automated trading bots, it's sort of like you can get a very cascading slide effect pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, like trying to create more confidence in the marketplace, um, you know, getting people to weather those storms, I think, has been really important. Um, and, and that just comes with just, you know, more maturity. Right. And more time. Um, and so for me, what I've learned is that, um, you know, it, when we have these sort of upswings, uh, if you can provide a great customer experience, if you can provide services, even in times when like market conditions are bad, people will come back. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and uh, salt. How, how big is Salt? Uh, we're about 60 employees based out of Denver. And we also have a uh, presence in Mauritius. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so what what for Salt are you um, really excited about in, in the next year? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I know we're at a Bitcoin conference, but uh, expansion of, of support of different chains. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of other projects that I think are really uh, valid in terms of an asset class, uh, either through utility or, you know, just a store of value. Uh, so expanding those, um, you know, real world asset tokenization is also really exciting. And that's something that we've been, you know, it's always been sort of a, a promise of salt is to be able to like, you know, borrow, you know, against any kind of tokenized asset, whether it's gold or diamonds or real estate, real estate or arts or whatever, right? Whatever you can tokenize and securitize, um, you know, uh, and those kinds of interesting projects that we'll be able to offer as, as collateral um, and support. As long as there's liquidity for it and it's on a chain that we can support, We'll do it. Right. And yeah. so those are the kinds of things that we're really excited about. Um, and then just like listening to our customers and providing services that they want. Um, mm-hmm. And that's how the, the Dash Masternode project came about. Um, we had people that were Dash Masternode holders, for example, come to us and say, I'd really love to, you know, uh, put up my Dash as collateral, but I don't want to lose my Masternode's uh, voting rights or passive income that I'm making off of, of operating this masternode. And our engineering team was able to figure it out and find a way to do it. And we're, you know, I think the only one in the space that um, allows you to maintain your own bespoke masternode um, and, and be able to leverage that against the loan. Oh, wow. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, some of those other projects, uh, do you want to mention any of any? in particular you're excited of? Um, I would love to. Uh, we're yeah. in the middle of like actually signing an agreement with um, a, a gold back token. And I, so I can't say which one, uh-huh. uh, but being, you know, a, a, a sort of preferred partner as part of in supporting their launch. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, gold, gold back loans is coming. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And this is a larger question, but um, outside of salt, just thinking externally, like the crypto industry in general, um, what are you excited about for the next year? To me, it's just breadth, right? Mm-hmm. Reach, right? You're so like what you're seeing at this conference here is you're seeing a lot of application layer development around sort of access and, you know, on and off rails with payment systems, um, you know, making this the, the broader, like I said, the broader, the better, right? Um, in terms of weathering market volatility, getting people excited about the product, um, you know, um, creating user experiences. Our, our head of product um, and marketing just did a talk on, you know, designing the killer app, right? And making things beautiful and invisible so that they're easy and seamless for people to interact with. Those, we need like a lot more of that. Um, so, uh, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, Rob O'Dell, was just giving a talk here on, you know, designing the killer app and the need for um, having beautiful and invisible u- user experience design in, in a way that like, you know, that that is going to be critical for adoption. Yeah. Right. Um, it's got to be easy. Um, and uh, and we're starting to see that with a lot of projects. So I think that's great. You're seeing things like um accounting software, right? You know, so if a company really wants to, you know, accept Bitcoin as payments, 
um, they need to do their books in Bitcoin, right? They need to have these t- sorts of infrastructure uh, tools, right? And you're starting to see those. Um, so you'll see a lot more movement once companies can operate the way that they traditionally operate with fiat. Yeah, so um, I feel like I, I see your career and I see you move from a, a job at a, a big bank mm-hmm. um, to something like this. And, you know, while, you know, you made the joke that, you know, it's like, oh, you're working for the big banks. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a lot of ways, I see it as, as working in a play, in a, an established institution to one that's not as established. And I was just interested, uh, what, what drew you to crypto? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, it really was, I'm a complete like accidental fool about oh, this. Okay. No, I'm serious. Um, I was really interested in just like, how can I uh, understand blockchain better to take that information back to big finance? Because that uh-huh. was where my sort of my comfort zone. Um, I was not a crypto enthusiast at all. I didn't get it, didn't understand it, didn't, you know, it was just wasn't even on my radar. Complete accident landed me in this position. Um, and I'm grateful for it. Um, you know, I, I really love the sort of disruptive nature, not just of the technology, but also what it represents. Um, and you know, so I'm, I've bought it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm a converted believer. Um, so that's been really exciting just to sort of, uh, to grow as like a person and, and professionally in my career of just having this opportunity. Yeah. There's a ton, tons of weirdos in this space. And it's, I, I always think it's interesting. I would never say that. I, saw, I always think it's interesting when, uh, I mean, when uh, someone comes from a different industry and it's like, how did you get into, so like, I guess my last question would be like, uh, what do you think, uh, what do you think uh, is important for somebody who works in the cryptocurrency industry? What is mm-hmm. a quality they need to have? Oh man. Uh, you know, I mean, grit is the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, what we've been able to weather over the last year has been hard. Um, you know, op- open mindedness too. It's like, you know, I, 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 there's a, there's, there's this really interesting tension of spectrum of like, you know, anarchists to sort of conformists, right. And everywhere mm-hmm. sort of in between of like, do we play with the banks or do we destroy the banks? That's sort of like yeah. this, you know, uh, break room talk that we will have. Right. Um, and my, my, my answer is, you know, both, right. I mean, you have to have that tension, but you also have to have a sort of open mindedness to know like, what is your end goal, right? Mm-hmm. Is it is it to truly disrupt fi- the financial system? There's going to have to be some level of outreach and adoption across the spectrum. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, opinion about Libra, but mm-hmm. I think they are actually, that is potentially a great use case example of just that, a potential bridge. Yeah. And uh, yeah, well, thanks. I-, I think that's a good, pretty good note to end it on. Thanks for taking the time to talk yeah, to us. Yeah, this is great. I do want to know, uh, what's your Bitcoin price prediction for the end of the year? Oh, shit. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've heard some wild... We've heard some um, dumb answers already, so don't worry. Okay, I mean, <laughs> you know, if we look at, like, just uh, market trends of the sort of up and down, you know, and it seems like as you gro- go into uh, the end of the year, things get bleaker. <laughs> yeah. Um, you I, know... I, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because everybody does the same exact, like... Yeah. Mm, okay, yeah. yeah, if we look at the market... Yeah, I mean, Everybody I would say I would thing. say it's going to be, uh, you know, thirty percent less of the the, the top price uh, that we see this year. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so let's say we can get up to like push fifteen k, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to be back down to twelve, eleven okay. five. Okay, yeah. that's that's Ele- pretty yeah. conservative. Eleven five. That's my prediction. Oh, All, so right. Gonna, All right. All right. Okay. We're going to go up and back down. Yeah. Okay. Wow. See, that's that's the, the very pragmatic. It's, yeah, it's well, like, I'm a I'm an operator. I'm not. <laughs> that's the most rational thing I've heard in this room today. I'm supposed today. to yeah. be pragmatic. <laughs> gotcha. A, yeah, we heard like seventy five thousand. That's absurd. Like, yeah, that was absurd. I, that would actually would scare me. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I kind of like felt my heart sink for some reason. Like, oh, what? Yeah, that's 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 a scary amount of like you guys um, get wealth out building. of that's a scary amount of wealth out of thin air and like unchecked just crazy right i i don't want that i want a nice steady you know yeah. steady go yes yeah yes. <laughs> you're gonna scare everybody <laughs> well well let's talk at the end of the year and yeah. uh, and we can like figure out what happened the bitcoin magazine podcast is a btc media produced podcast on the let's talk bitcoin network special thanks to our guests sean rock and Ginny shaver Theme music provided by Billy Sly from the Crypto Cantina. 
Stories in this episode were written by Bitcoin Magazine writers including Peter Chwaga, Colin Harper, Aaron Van Weirdham, Landon Manning, and Vlad Kostia. Visit BitcoinMagazine.com for more in-depth news, analysis, and resources about the most successful peer-to-peer currency. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, at Bitcoin Magazine. Find and subscribe to the show wherever else you get your podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.